Hey everybody, welcome to Hills at Home for the holidays. And um, you know, since you are at home, I thought that we would maybe do service from our home uh, this week. Uh, in fact, unfortunately, I picked up a little bug. No, don't, don't worry. There's no nausea. There's no temperature. Just you know, the typical kind of thing that runs around during this time of year. I'm feeling great, um, but I just thought it would be wiser. Um, you always want to take the most precautions that you can. So we decided to uh, record our gathering today from, from home. Plus you get to see how beautiful our, our tree is. Hey, um, Jordan's gonna lead us in worship this morning. So would you join together as we celebrate the wonderful name that is Jesus. And I, uh, I love that Christmas version of what's one of my favorite worship songs. 
So uh, thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for uh, leading us today. Um, we are continuing our series called Goodness and Light, which comes from a very famous Christmas song, Do You um, See What I See? And it is the, um, the song, do you, do you See What I See? Do You Hear What I Hear? And this week we're going to be talking about Do You Know What I Know? And interestingly enough, the song um, is told from the shepherd boy's perspective. He goes to the king and said, do you know what I know? Now, that's kind of a silly question for a boy to be asking uh, to be asking the king. In fact, in most situations, the story would be flipped. The, the king would be trying to tell the shepherd boy, hey, do you know what I know? Or really, you don't know what I know. But that's kind of the, the miracle and the mystery of the nativity story, of the Advent story. It is that part of Christmas that the ordinary and insignificant, they are people who have information that the important and influential people don't have. And the, the, the interesting thing is the manner by which they obtain this information and are informed is, is anything but everyday and ordinary. And so I want to take a look at probably the two people who are most central and important to the story of Christmas. I want to read to you from Luke chapter 1. We're going to begin in verse 26 and uh, read through a few verses together. Will you follow along with me, please? Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed by, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. And then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the son of the highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob or Israel forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I have never known a man? Then the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also, that Holy One which is to be born will be called the Son of God. And Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. You know, I don't know if you've ever thought about what this encounter may have been with was what in the movies, it would be like at night with fireworks and, you know, maybe in this little tiny, you know, room that the, the, the wings of angel Gabriel wouldn't even be able to be unfolded into this little tiny, um, I don't know, track home in Nazareth, but maybe that wasn't the picture. Maybe what if it, what if it was daytime? Mary answered the door as if any neighbor was there visiting or dropping by or a stranger who might have needed something. And she opened her door to a very maybe unassuming visitor. In fact, it says having, having come in, like he didn't force his way in, waited for an invitation to come in. And I wonder if when it said that Mary was troubled by the greeting that this, that this stranger gave her was because... It wasn't what she was expecting. In fact, this message was pretty overwhelming. How do you, a stranger tell you that you are about to conceive and that your baby's name, they already give you the name of this baby, which isn't even unique in itself. The name Jesus or Yahshua or, or Joshua, as we would say it transliterated in English, simply means salvation, the most common name of all child of, of all males in Israel because of the promise that it has as it looks to the day that the Messiah would come and bring salvation to all of their people. That 
he would rule over the house of Jacob or rule over Israel because he was of the throne of David. Mary's first response to this announcement was like, how can this be like, you cannot be serious. Like, it's something like when somebody gives us information that we can't put all of the pieces together, all of a sudden it just seems too impossible to be true. In fact, we have a saying, if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. And I wonder if some of that went through Mary's mind or if maybe this idea was so foreign, she couldn't even process it. What we find about ourselves is that we just don't need information. What we really need to know is when we get data that we're not sure what to do with, we need to understand the plan or the steps through which it's going to be executed or carried out so that we could prepare ourselves to be able to participate. The angel told her that this was going to happen because God was going to do something special. The Spirit of God, it says, is going to overshadow her and that she would conceive. I, I, I can't even imagine what that would, would look like, what that would feel like, what that would what that would mean. But all of a sudden it became Mary's reality. The thing that became reality for her as well is she's now pregnant. Nine months of heartburn and discomfort and not being able to sleep and eating all the time and swollen feet. It's amazing how so often the process of the supernatural breaks down into something that seems so normal, so ordinary, almost inconvenient for us. When we begin to put all those things together, we're faced with a choice of how we're going to respond to the Word of God. And Mary's response is so courageous. She, she says this, Let it be unto me according to your word. Let's, let's step out of this story for a minute again to maybe rethink this through. Could there be another scenario? I mean, I can't imagine that in all of Nazareth, that Mary was the only virgin or the only available young woman who is in, had the right credentials, had the right uh, bloodline, having been a descendant, tracing her lineage back to, to King David. I wonder, I've had this thought before, like, what if Mary wasn't the only one that the angel visited? That maybe she was the only one who opened the door and said yes. Maybe she was the only one who gave God access to her life for it to be used any way that he saw fit. See, Mary knew something. That God's promise always requires a commitment for our participation. It doesn't guarantee us to have all the blanks filled in. And it's going to require us to walk some things out in a very practical, in a very practical way. But our confidence is in the promise and in the word of God. And so it isn't only about Mary's story. It's also about Joseph's. You know, I think that Joseph is one of the most underappreciated people in the scripture. Beyond the nativity story and maybe one other situation in Jesus' childhood, we don't know much about Joseph. Things we can put together in his, the puzzle piece of his life is that while he was a descendant of royalty, he too was from the line of David, that he spent his life as a blue-collar tradesman. We know that he was engaged to be married to a young woman, who is now pregnant with a baby that wasn't his. The scripture tells us that at different times in his life, he had to spend time living in a foreign country as an immigrant, trying to earn a living and provide for his family and protect his family. None of this convenient. None of this easy. In fact, I think one of the hardest things is that we don't even get to see the happy ending. The victory that comes from persevering through adversity and the reward that comes from people acknowledging your hard work and that it has all paid off in the end. Instead, Joseph kind of 
fades into the background. Again, we're confronted with the idea that the reminder that maybe God doesn't work the way that we always think that he should. But what we do get to experience in the story of the man who is charged with the privilege and the responsibility of fathering the Messiah is a sense of what it is to be invited to partner with God. Let's read about Joseph's story from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they, they came together as husband and wife, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not wanting to make her a public example, was had thoughts to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Spirit. She shall bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. All of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. That Joseph, being awoken from his sleep, did as the angel commanded him. He took to him his wife, and he did not know her until she had brought forth her firstborn son. And he, Joseph, called him the baby Jesus. I can't imagine a more challenging situation than Joseph was placed in upon discovering that his young fiance was pregnant. Like, how do you save face? How do you start over? We can see that, that Joseph was already starting to make a plan with the information that he had. He knew he wasn't the father. He couldn't quite explain how this was happening. He didn't want to humiliate this young woman and was trying to sort through, what do I do next? feels much like our lives where we're evaluating our life circumstances based on the information we have at hand and our past experience. And we try to make sense of the next step that we should take so that people wouldn't get hurt or that um, the pain wouldn't be too much. But I don't know that that's always the, the, the right response. I think sometimes we need to be available for God to interrupt our lives, just as the angel did with Joseph as he appeared to him in this dream. The challenge is I would have wanted the angel to make that same kind of announcement that he made to Joseph to the rest of his family. It would have been so much easier if the angel explained how Mary got pregnant, how um, that would have explained it to Joseph's own parents and family and to the larger community that would quiet all the whispers and the murmurings and the accusations that were going around. You can't really tell anybody that you're about to be the dad to the Messiah. Nobody's going to believe you, especially based on who you are and where you come from. So Joseph still had a choice to make. And that choice was not going to sit well with a lot of people. But I'll tell you what, if he doesn't make that choice, we may not be here. Because the choice that Joseph made to believe God's word and to know of God's faithfulness rippled through the centuries all the way to us. That becomes an example of faith for us. Joseph somehow believed God's word, knew that God was faithful, and he embraced the assignment that God had entrusted to him. I think sometimes we feel we feel God's nudge. We feel his, his pull. We, we hear his word, but we're not sure we're able to act because maybe that causes a change to our plans. As we're trying to make the best of a situation of whatever has been handed to us, it's very difficult to place our confidence just in a thought or in a vision or in a dream. And yet, Joseph responded in faith not only by taking Mary as his wife, but on the day when the baby is born, he had a choice to make, to affirm the promise, to affirm the directive that God had given to him in naming this baby. And Joseph, Joseph responded 
and affirmed God's word by naming this baby with the name that is above every other name, the name that is now our hope and our salvation. The problem is, is that as anybody who's raised children know, this is when the journey of faith really begins. After the time has passed that God has given his word and he's fulfilled his word, like now life really begins. He had to take Mary as his wife. They had to begin to build a household. Like this whole thing would have been so much easier for Joseph had he not done what God asked of him. It would have been so much simpler. In fact, he even had to say no to his own, uh, to his own self, to his own desires, to his own uh, dreams, putting them on hold until after the baby was born. You ever felt like that? You ever felt like life's been on hold? Listen, you're a good company. The Bible is full of examples of people who had to see patience have its perfect work in their life. While we wait, God is at work. And while um, we're waiting, his plan is in process. So these two people show us what we should do when God speaks to us. Mary reminds us that partnering with God requires us to live within these two tensions. How can this be and be it unto me? You may not have all the information you want and may not have all the steps lined out exactly the way that you would want them to be guaranteed. Most importantly, you need to understand that God invites us in to partner with him because we have found favor with him. Not because we've earned it or deserved it, but because he loves us and has a promise and a destiny that's in store uniquely for us. Joseph reminds us that our greatest achievements in life really is the simple obedience to God's word. Because what could be a greater achievement in life than to be known as someone who did everything that God had asked of him? Listen, from today's story, what we need to know is that what is conceived in the heart of God is often birthed through the lives of everyday people by the power of this Holy Spirit. People who know what he knows and place their behavior and their action and their trust in the word of God. Dear Heavenly Father, may we be those kind of people, those people who place a simple confidence in the word and in the promise you have given us that we would fill it with availability and obedience as you continue to work your will and your way in our life so that you would be glorified and honored. Lord, when we are fearful, bring comfort to us. When it is hard, offer strength. But Lord, let us be people who match your word with great courage and faith. We love you. We bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody, thank you for joining with us today. Just a couple of thoughts for next Sunday, December 20th, and for Christmas Eve, the, um, the 24th. Along with our online stream, we are going to provide the opportunity for those of you who would like to gather in person um, to join us at the church building to celebrate Christmas Sunday and Christmas Eve together in person. Now it's very important that we follow all of the safety protocols. They will all be in place, but we feel that there are just sometimes um, things that are too important. Now there is no pressure for anybody to have to come. Uh, we will, again, most of us will be gathering uh, via the online stream. But for those of you who would like to join us in person, we want you to know that you are welcome to do so. Uh, please bring your mask and um, uh, we will seat uh, socially distance. But next Sunday, December 20th at 10 a.m. and on Thursday, the 24th for Christmas Eve at 6 p.m. at the Merritt Circle uh, at our church building. So we want to invite you to join us in whatever way uh, serves your family the best as we uh, celebrate the most amazing miracle of all time. The fact that God came to us to be with us, to live among us, and now lives forever in us as we celebrate these holy days 
of Christmas. We're hoping you have a wonderful week, and uh, God bless you.